Polska. I am also a recruitment consultant here at Jackson Grant. Um, I come from Poland. Um, I've been living in Thailand for three and a half years, married to a Frenchman. Um, yeah. I thought you was French. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it Monica Benoit now? Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Monica recently got, got married, so <laughs> congratulations to Monica. Thank you very much. Yeah, she, yeah. she just got an upgrade. Okay. <laughs> upgrade. A transformation. Version. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so today um, we are still in the series of um, diversity and inclusion. Um, last week, no, last few weeks, um, we have Nick and June Dai like joining us in our Gen Gap, you know, and how can we bridge the gap? And today we're gonna have um, the the what can I say like the discussion on on cross cultural um, collaboration at workplace and how we can like embrace the diversity for success. Um, so today I'm gonna run through the the agenda very quickly. First thing first, like uh, we're gonna talk about what is the value for you in terms of uh, working in diverse workplace. The second one, it will be strategy to promote an open communication and understanding. How can we bridge the gap in cross-cultural um, work environment and how can we overcome challenges and misconception? Um, the third one will be, um, you know, like a tip for the company or team leaders to cultivate the, an inclusive and supportive workplace. And the last one will be um, the, to share real life success stories from the companies that have embraced the cross-cultural collaboration and reap the benefit of it. So the last one will be Q&A for sure. Um, anybody, if you have like, you know, any question, can you can drop it on a comment and now we will go through it like at the end of the session. Okay, so um, first, First and formal, okay, um, what is the value for you in terms of working in the, what can I say, like um, cross-cultural and diverse workplace? Well, I think uh, to begin with in general, um, diversity for me is, um, of course, you know, open communication, basic understanding. I don't think so. You have to completely understand someone culturally or dig into or do a research you know it's just a basic understanding of people and their culture mm -hmm. um so for me it's of course open communication um having a you know that warmth that welcomeness from a person to another person mm -hmm. and uh, yeah for me that would that was cv um and i'm sure monica would like to say more on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's yeah. for me. It's funny because when I think about it, so actually since the beginning of my career, a couple of years ago, I, I realized that I've never worked in a company that would be like monocultural. I've always worked with people or companies that are coming from different cultures, and I realized that I could. Like I refer there, I'm not able to work with one culture only, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just that what I appreciate a lot in multicultural environment is that it it totally challenge your point of view and your kind of, you know, the way you approach different problems and, and challenges because you, you bring people from, you know, very different cultures in one place and uh, everybody comes with their own habits and the way of communication mm -hmm. and you have to figure out how to create this kind of new language, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and how to communicate with each other and that's the beauty of it. I think nobody really is more important, everybody's mm -hmm. equal and everybody has to work together to, to figure it out, you know, to, to make yeah. it effective. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and um, how, like, uh, what, what, what about you, Alex? I think you have been working in like cross-cultural environments since like how many years, 12 years? Oh, don't don't age me. <laughs> it's a lot longer than that. Yeah. Um, I think it's turn it on its head. It's more like when you work in a monocultural environment. I think some of the the disadvantages is people are not sharing different ideas. So when everybody acts the same and thinks the same, then you get the same results. Yes. So if you start to work in a multicultural environment, people from different cultures have different ideas, different set of values, different entrepreneurial sort of ideas to change the business i mean i i in the rehearsal i talked to you guys about uh, what uh mobile phones right mm -hmm. and i take i'll share this story very quickly which is uh pre nokia owning the mobile phone market in japan it was where what was founded um and there was one company that had 97 percent of the the market mm -hmm. and this company was a boardroom full of 
Japanese men in their 50s who all thought the same. And they tried to take their business internationally, and within 18 months, they were bankrupt. And the reason being is they had nobody from a different cultural background or different ideas coming to the table. And I think the biggest, biggest thing to, to have in a diverse workplace is ideas. And by having the ability to openly share those ideas and it being welcomed and valued, I think that's the biggest important part of, of uh, a diverse workplace. I mean, Anna, can you share your story that you told us earlier yeah, about yeah, your sure. internship? I think that's super interesting. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you know, that uh, I, I went to international schools and universities. So, for me, one of the, you know, first cultural shock that I would say when I started working um, in a hotel, okay, <laughs> and um, I was doing my internship basically for three months. So when I was there at the front desk, um, basically I was a trainee there and you were supposed to do whatever your seniors told you to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, when would, they would explain to you that this is your job, um, this is what you have to do, the other Thai trainees would just be like, you know, ha, 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 that's it, you know, that's it. Um, and they don't have any other comments, but um, I'd ask questions, you know, like, um, then how do you do this, how do you do that, why, this and that. and. I think they kind of made this very strict line that, um, okay, you know what, I don't have time to explain you everything, just go. Yeah. Like they would actually just say, you know, just go or just be rude or just, you know, uh, kind of make sure that you're a trainee, you're not supposed to, you know, ask so much questions. You're yeah. supposed to do what we tell you to do. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Um, and, um, but I didn't really, I think I couldn't adapt completely into that. Um, and I also, kind of gave an impression that, um, you know, I will be doing my own thing. I will be asking questions whether you like it or not. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think uh, because of this, they, they you know, uh, kept a code name for me. But that was, of course, <laughs> behind me. What was the code they name? Would, uh, they <laughs> called me uh, Kundi. <laughs> and um, I got to know about this from another trainee. Mm -hmm was uh, also working with me and she came from another university and she's like, oh, but Question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. So for the people that don't know Thai culture, what uh -huh. does Kunying mean? I think mean, it's like, um, madam. Madam, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, like, miss something. Yeah. <laughs> many, yeah. I think there's many more meanings to that. <laughs> um, won't be, you know, able to translate completely into mm -hmm. English, but yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, and um, basically she told me that, you know, well, this is what they call you when you enter the room mm -hmm. and this is, you know, how they call you there. That's your code word. Yeah. But yeah. I still didn't care. I was like, it's okay. <laughs> but I, I can, yeah. I, can I add on that? I think it's like in Thai culture, you know, they're just like, um, what can I say? Like, we kind of like follow the rule. We don't really ask, you know, and, and I think like in terms of like cross Cultural, we don't really work with people from like you know different like nationalities mm -hmm. or race, you know. And I think it also comes with a language barrier, yeah. and there there might be something lost in translation of like mm -hmm. you know like uh, the action, you know. Mm -hmm. For example, like when you ask why, and they would just like why you ask, you mm -hmm. do it, you you do it that way. You don't yeah. break um, what can I say? You don't break the queue. You 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 stay in the line, you know. And they kind of like expect you to be like. What can I say? Like we are in a collective society. Mm -hmm. So when you start to, you know, ask something and then well, they will start question, yeah, yeah what, 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 why you ask. Mm -hmm. So I think this is like um, Thai culture in, what can and, I say? And that's the complete opposite from the yeah. culture that I was raised in. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like ask questions why. Make yeah. sure you, you, you understand why you're being asked to do something. Yes. Question, push. Make it yeah. better. So yeah. for an expat that's coming to Thailand and, and doesn't really understand that, yeah. they ask the big question like, why is it like this? Mm -hmm. And you can see like you get some really intelligent people that have been successful in their career mm -hmm. and they will come to Thailand or Asia or mm -hmm. you know, another country in Southeast Asia and they will fail. Mm -hmm. And they'll fail because they're not open enough to adapt to the different mm -hmm. cultures in the organization. And I think it's as much on the expat or the, the new person going into mm -hmm. a different culture to adjust yeah. mm -hmm. as the company to welcome them as well. Exactly. Because yeah. I think um, these kind of things also create some misunderstanding, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you are coming to a country, you need to understand you know, the basic culture of the country. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, also that, but um, yeah, but I think throughout the time, also there has been a lot of changes, yeah. even in mm -hmm. ties. Yeah. 
you know, um, maybe that would be somehow correlated to the age. Yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. I'd say that there, there's still, you know, a lot of difference happening. I also remember that I had, the, you know, because Anna, I think you, you discovered at some point what kind of companies work for you and why it wasn't yeah. a match. And, yeah. you know, I, me coming from Poland, you know, we, um, I always say that Poland is somewhere in between East and West, you know, so I don't mm -hmm. consider myself really Western and I don't consider myself really from the Eastern countries, really like a mix. And uh, Polish people tend to be, you know, we learn to be polite, especially girls, you know, so mm -hmm. this is where I feel very close to Thai culture, like do not start the conflict, do not, you are more you know. Thai than ex <laughs> <laughs> And you know, and coming from this background, um, I started to work with British people, you know, with French people. <laughs> okay. So what was your experience working with British people then? Yeah, that's, so then I met Alex, you know, <laughs> and this yeah. is how it started. No, and you know, and this is the huge advantage of working with different cultures. You suddenly yeah. see that it's completely okay to have a different perspective, to to be a little bit different than you are in a different, you know, like natural, let's say how you were, you know, um, how you grown up and you know whatever like habit you, you you bring from your country. Yeah, so you know, I started to work with, with here, and I think Asia is amazing also for its uh, entrepreneurial culture, you know, you're very like, um, I think Asian people, they are not afraid to basically start their own thing, to start a business, to talk, network, um, you know, you're quite open to other people and quite open to connect, to create these connections, you know, but for this, you have to be a little bit more open, you have to push sometimes, yeah. you know, you have to like go to, to talk to people and sometimes you have to negotiate, sometimes you have to say no. And I think working here, but also working with people like Alex, for example, it opened my mind to different kind of perspective, different, you know, uh, like uh, attitudes. And I realized that it's completely okay to be, you know, to say no to someone, mm -hmm. it's completely okay to defend, you know, your point of view, yeah. to say, I'm not okay with that. This is what I want, you know, this is why I'm going to negotiate. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would, um, you know, understand that so quickly if I stayed in Poland and if I was working for a local company. Yeah. So, um, so you are, you are saying that Alex being tough to you? <laughs> No, not at all. He's the kindest British in the world. Scouts. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, he's not British. He's scouts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Moving on to uh, to the next topic, right? So um, the strategy to promote open communication and under and understanding how can we bridge the gap in cross cultural work environment, and how can we overcome the challenges and misconceptions. Sure. Um, uh, I would like to uh, ask first. So um, I think when we talk about bridging the gap, mm -hmm. it has to come, um, you know, both ways. For yeah. me, it's a two-way thing, not just one-way thing. Um, why I say this is because um, I have had a few experiences in the past where you just, you know, you are trying to mend, you are trying to understand, and you are trying to, you know, just um, be the one that okay, let's reach there at the 50 or 80, 20. Mm -hmm. And then some, and then, but later that's going to affect you personally, mm -hmm. right? So I think it has to come from the opposite side as well. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, um, again, basic understanding from both the sides and learning about each other. And I think uh, one of the simplest things that many people don't do is that they don't ask directly that, okay, if you said this, then like, what was your exact meaning towards it? Mm -hmm. So maybe because of cake jai, right? Yeah. And, um, so that creates again misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. And when you don't ask, why did you say this? And then that's a bit disliking happens and mm -hmm. just, just, just increases. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean from my from my point of view, I can see some of the comments coming in and we'll we'll talk about these a little bit later on. But I think you it, in terms of a strategy to promote open communication, <clears throat> particularly in Thailand, you've got to create a cultural like sort of um, understanding of safety in the business. So if somebody does have an idea and it's a bad idea, they're not going to be criticized for that idea. And it's got to come from top right the way down. Um, I think you've definitely got to show that people can talk and that people want to be, that you want to listen to people. Um, one of the most difficult things that companies will do is like they will have like a pulse survey or a yearly engagement tool to find out how the staff feel. But if you do that only once a year, maybe you get the person on a good day, maybe you get them on a bad day, and it's pointless. 
Mm -hmm. Whereas we've got some strategies internally at Jackson Grant, which means we engage with our staff every day. And you guys engage with us with, through through an application. Uh, I won't mention the name, but I think you guys are pretty happy using it. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, I think you've also got to make sure that the staff see that you care. Like it's genuine, it's authentic. And mm -hmm. this is a strategy where, you know, you can bridge the gap because if I bring in a 22 year old Thai person with no experience, but they're really dynamic and they want to learn, then they'll have that opportunity. But if they don't want to learn, it'll be a different story. And <clears throat> people need to understand like, you know, everything with what they can do, what they can't do, what's safe, what's not safe. And I think having safety will really promote for Thai people to really open their mouths and speak mm -hmm. of yeah. how they feel. But I would just add on to what you were saying, Anna, which is, you know, it has to be two ways. Mm -hmm. Well, internally, I agree, but externally, because we're dealing with clients and customers, sometimes we have to play a role. So mm -hmm. sometimes I'll work with HR executives and, you know, they will want me to act a certain way. So I have to act that way until I can gain their trust and then I can start to influence and I can be myself and I can consult with them. Mm -hmm. But whilst the you know the barriers are there you can't do that and it takes time and this is like the art of consultancy as well mm -hmm. yeah. but that's also about the timing like when they can actually try and change change their mind or you know mm -hmm. try to put your um thoughts out there mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah, it definitely takes a lot of time for this. I wouldn't say it's a one-day job, of course not, <laughs> because understanding takes time. Yeah, well, I would say like it's of course this is not something you can really impose, you know, or introduce. Not and you can you cannot really introduce a policy saying right from today we are diverse, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys deal with it because this is where you leave this kind of gap for misunderstandings. For you know, it, it just remains a cliche, really. If it's not mm -hmm. practical, it's just a theory, right? Yeah. So you know, a colorful flag looks really well on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but then in theory, you look into a company, and you know, people don't really care. Um, so I think, yeah, it, it, you know, it really goes both ways, as Anna said, and, you know, we have to also take into consideration that people are very different, not all the people are open, you know, unfortunately, yeah. and, you know, and it, you know, there, there will be people who, you know, maybe come from a different generation, come from a different background, and it's not that they're not naturally open, maybe they're just, they've never seen anything else, you know, yeah. it's weird, it's strange, it's something new for them, they don't know how to navigate it. So, you know, it's it, it comes, you know, from one side, I think it's great if it's genuine amongst the employees. And from the other side, I think management has to figure out ways to work on it, you know, how to encourage people, how to show them the way, how to show that there's nothing like strange, you know, in it. Um, you know, I, I just remember, you know, in my previous company, for example, we, we really had people from all over the world, like all continents. And, um, you know, I think we were speaking around 20 languages in the office that didn't even have 100 people <laughs> so <laughs> so i remember that you know our company obviously was international and we had the rule that english is the main language but even people were, were very respectful of this rule you know any time we would like, speak in polish for example in a kitchen and um, someone would come up and tease us like oh great guys you know it's really great what you're saying and you know this person that was mean and um, they just really wanted to be a part of the conversation remind us that you know it would be great if we include this person we we're like oh yes yeah, sorry sorry and it's we immediately see switch to French, it switch to English, sorry. <laughs> you are French. too French now. I'm too French now. <laughs> okay. uh, so it's really, you know, it comes, can, it can come from the employees and this is where I think it's ideal, but not every office is like that. And, you know, we have to give the space and, and, and time to people to adapt and to discover it as well. Like, I think it's like um, for especially like for recruitment business, mm -hmm. we will we will like can I say like uh, we will work with people from like you know so many like nationalities, and I think like English can be probably like the the only way we can communicate mm -hmm. with like you know and like what can I say universal language mm -hmm. I would say that we we all can communicate to each other. However, there might be some. What can something lost in translation yeah. you know like oh, yeah. something that like um the culture behind the language i think that's the the big gap that we need to come across yeah true okay 
So the third one, as a season uh, as a season recruiter, do you have any practical tips for the companies and the team leaders to cultivate an um, inclusive and supportive workplace? Okay, so I'll take this one. So I think first of all, as a company, if you're trying to have diversity and 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 you know different uh, inclusive environments, then it has to be part of your company values. You have to eat, live, breathe, everything about it. Mm -hmm. um, you can't just turn around one day and say, right, we're open to everybody, or we're, we're now cultural. Mm -hmm. It's got to be authentic, it's got to be planned, and it's something that takes time, and everybody has to be a part of it. It cannot just be HR, because if it's just HR leading it, essentially what you're saying is it's my job to make us culturally open, but it's not, it's everybody's job in the company. I believe it's HR's job, to really set the boundaries on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And then from there, everybody should feed into that to help cultivate an inclusive and supportive workplace. Mm -hmm. um, I think also having some, some strategies in terms of your hiring. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't mean that you should only hire a female or you should only hire a transgender person, but it's making sure those people feel open to, to apply. So for example, one thing that I did a while back was I put under my signature, he, him, right? And then people might say, well, why, why did you do that? Because you're a straight guy, you're married. And I said, well, it's not about me. It's about showing that I'm welcoming all people and I recognize that people can be different, mm -hmm. you know, so for LGBTQ, IA plus plus, mm -hmm. yeah, so for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think also in terms of practical tips for HR, it's about the communication between all stakeholders in the business. So it's not just you with your stick beating people saying we need to be open to different cultures. Mm -hmm. Everyone understands and the reasons why. Because if we go back to what we discussed at the beginning, we're talking about how many how many people have different ideas, how how people can contribute differently within the workplace. And if everybody thinks they have to stick to a rule book, then they're less likely to open up. Um, but I also think that, you know, once you speak to so many people over time, mm -hmm. you eventually change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not people telling you that, you know, um, this is how they are or this is not the problem. You just know. Mm -hmm. You just know. So I think it's about you also going out there, exploring yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because if you just want to be in your own comfort zone and don't want to, you know, break your own barriers and stay in a room and be like, you know, this is how who I am and this is only these are the kind of people I want to speak to, then mm -hmm. also you're not you're not growing professionally. Mm -hmm. You're not yeah. growing personally. Mm -hmm. You're not yeah. growing anywhere. Yeah. And also you're gonna limit your knowledge. Like you're just limiting your knowledge. You're not yeah. learning anymore. Yeah, I agree. I agree because um, at the beginning, as uh, in my career at Jackson Grant, I would say it's probably the very first, right, very first like workplace that I can work like in this like cross cultural um, working environment. So I have a Polish friend here. I got like a Thai Indian friend here. I got like British manager. I think this is like um, where I am at the beginning. I was so afraid because um, my English was like, I, I am afraid that my English was not that great to be able to communicate with everybody. It was more American. <laughs> you, you sound regret. <laughs> so, um, that's why like um, I in here I learn a lot it's like you know not only English communication but how to adapt myself to people from different cultures you know and we are not only Thai here we you know we need to respect them as a person and we share the space we share the workplace mm -hmm. so um, to, to show them the respect and I think I, I'm quite like happy to to what can I say to be here because um, as a team I think I feels like I can be very direct and nobody judge me <laughs> because like in Thai culture, sometimes I feel like I'm so scared. Like I grain Thai to, to, to talk about what mm -hmm. I really want to how, how I really feel even. So um, now like here at Jackson Grant is like very eyes opening to me. And like, you know, it's been two years of like, you know, being like, what can I say in like a very diverse mm -hmm. workplace. And also the project I'm currently working on is like um, international cooperation which is like even more like, you know, open like eyes opening to me to like, you know, to work with the candidates from like, you know, out like across Southeast Asia, India. And that's really 
you know, like great experience. And mm -hmm. back to what Anna just said, like if you don't get yourself out there to, you know, to develop yourself, to be able to to work with any people, I think at the end of the day, you would just like sit in the back and waiting for someone to, to talk to you and then you're not going to learn anything. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And also, since you said that you've been working with in Indian Sam, right? Yeah. But now you have friends who are Thai Indians, including yeah. me, and now you know, you know, Indians from India. Yeah. But now you can see some difference with yes. us. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So even there are like there are like few slight differences, but mm -hmm. I mean, but it's kind of good to know that how your own background and different race can affect you. Yeah. Like I, as I mentioned, that I'm born and brought up here. My father was born here. Mm -hmm. But he went to a local school, Thai school. Mm -hmm. So for his first language is Thai. Mm -hmm. It's not even Hindi. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, being an Indian race, it should be. Like, as you know, we follow the societal rules that it should be like this. But no, it's not always what it should be. Mm -hmm. And um, he learned, he adapted. Mm -hmm. My mother, she came from India. She speaks Hindi, but she learned, she adapted. Mm -hmm. So um, we speak three languages at home, you know. <laughs> But my uncle, um, he adapted a little bit, I'd say. <laughs> so he was also born here. Um, he speaks Thai and English only. He looks Indian, but if someone, if some Indian go to him and speak in Hindi, he might not be able to speak yeah. properly. Which yeah. is so, like, wow. Like, yeah. really, you don't know how to speak Hindi properly. Yeah. But his yeah. Thai is fluent. His English is fluent. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, sometimes we judge, but we might be wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I think we a little bit like cover on the the, the food topic, but yeah, <laughs> um, the the last one would be sharing the real life success stories from the companies that have embraced um, cross cultural collaboration and reap the benefits. Alex, any any comments on that? As okay, a, I'll be quick because we're going to run out of time. So <laughs> I guess one of the first things that I'm quite happy about is when we made our first hire um, for somebody who was transgender. So this person I knew was really struggling to get a job. Uh, I believe this person has had over 30 interviews with different companies and nobody would give her a chance. Uh, and I felt that we did. And it wasn't just because she was transgender that we hired this person. Is they demonstrate this person demonstrated uh, you know the right personality, the right skills, the right acumen to come in and, and be a successful junior staff member and then that person did and you know was here and i think did quite successfully mm -hmm. and now this person's now moved on to work in a multinational environment and i think i'm pretty proud that we probably gave the, the first step on that ladder mm -hmm. um so that i would say that would be my success story yeah what do you yeah, I had actually a similar story, you know, so I, I managed to hire a transgender person. She, she was absolutely brilliant, you know, and um, from the from the first conversation with her, she was in the HR field. I could say that she's an exceptional HR um, and um, basically her struggle was that she never worked in the private sector before she was working for NGOs and, you know, so, um, you know, she wanted to make a move, but nobody wanted to give her a chance. Um, and, you know, we I talk with her a lot and I talk a lot with my clients. And, you know, she was totally underpaid for her skills and that you could tell from, from the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, we managed to negotiate almost double the salary increase for her. Um, because basically we had this conversation, well, I had this conversation with clients explaining, you know, this is the situation and this is why I think she's underpaid. And everybody can clearly say that she she's ready for more. Mm -hmm. She's ready to step up and, you know, she would be an excellent HR manager. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, it goes on, uh, on like many ways, you know, I, I like to advocate, for example, for people over 45, 50 in the workplace because I feel they're like very badly ignored today. It, it's a gray zone, you know. The same, you know, for foreigners, you know, for, for black skin people, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there are really a lot of groups you can advocate for as a recruiter, and that's the beauty of this, of this uh, job, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had a good example earlier. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so um, my previous company, I was working for a new um, educational agency mm -hmm. that would hire teachers. Um, so we would hire international teachers for international school, mm -hmm. but um, they would not accept black people. You know, um, even though if they are coming from US, UK, uh, native, bilingual, but no, they wouldn't accept. Um, so after you know many meetings and a few controversies and the meeting happening, 
um, I was able to manage and hire the black people, which mm -hmm. was um, quite a change. Um, yeah. But here it is, we had to educate the parents mm -hmm. that, um, you know, uh, even though they look black or, you know, no matter, regardless of their background or race, um, they can still, you know, teach in English. So I think um, when we consult, so it's just not about um, what the company itself is doing, but mm -hmm. the end user, right? Yeah. the end user. So for us, it's our clients. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, our role also here comes in when we have to try and educate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, in terms of like, you know, um, diversity, diversity and inclusion, you know, as like um, include, yeah, the gender, the age, also the, the nationality, the race, right? So uh, I think most of the workplace, they, I mean, I think it's quite like buzzword for in mm -hmm. 2022, 2023, like every company that just throw in the word, yeah, diversity and inclusion. But when it comes to the real action, I think uh, we really, uh, what can I say, look through the, through the policy and how they're going to make it happen. Because um, at, at the beginning, I think it's very easy for everybody to just like, yeah, it's just you, you, you just mentioned that, okay, you put the rainbow flag in the season and then it just okay mm -hmm. this is like we embrace it right so um i think here it's like um hopefully we can give you some tips to you know to really make it happen and take it like in practice in action so um moving on to the next um session will be q a so let, let me jump in here then because mm -hmm. In the interest of time, I've mm -hmm. just I've seen a couple of the questions come in. Uh, yeah. Can you pop Alice's question on the screen for us? Yeah. Alice, Kundirapon. Yeah. Okay, so Kundirapon says she's currently working in HR and facing a challenge where Thai staff are afraid to communicate mm -hmm. or interaction with an expat. Do you have any insights or suggestions? Okay, so to to address this one, from Alice, I would say. First and foremost, do the expats know that people are scared to talk to them? Because it might be a good idea to take the expats to one side and say to them, look, we're facing some communication gaps in the organization. Do you have any idea about this? What are your thoughts and feedback? Because there may be some expats where people do feel confident communicating. There may be other expats where they don't. So you need to kind of understand where the, the barriers are, first and foremost. Second thing is I can contact you contact you individually after this to share with you uh, some exciting sort of products that we have. So I can say June, uh, about a year ago, uh, went on a course uh, that we promoted. Um, and when you did this course, it was uh, for uh, non-English speakers to work yes. with expats. And I always remember the first thing you said to me was, ah, Alex, I know now how you solve problems, why you do things this way. Mm -hmm. And it's because in an Asian sort of society, you, you get all the information and then solve the problem. But for British, for example, we get part of, of the information and solve it step by step. Mm -hmm. So it's these small cultural differences that maybe people don't understand. But for you, Alice, it sounds like the Thai staff are, are scared. So which means that they don't feel that the organization is a safe place for them to get their views out. So the first thing you need to do as HR, spend time with them individually, listen to them, listen to what, why they don't feel comfortable, and then try to make subtle changes, but have a strategic plan over, let's say, a six to 12 month period to make the changes happen. Um, it won't happen overnight, and I'm happy to connect with you individually to give you a few other tips offline. But I agree with you, Alex, that it should go both ways. It's not only working with Thai employees, it's also working with expats. I personally know expats who are doing getting along very well from day one. They know exactly how to chat with Thai colleagues, you know, to kind of just break the ice. And uh, I, on the other hand, I know a lot of expats who say, um, you know, I just joined a new company. It's completely Thai. I'm the only foreigner. And to be honest, I feel isolated because they speak Thai all the time, uh, because they never speak to me. They didn't welcome me. Um, so you know, the, so it it goes both ways, and both both groups can feel isolated or, or afraid to talk to each other, right? Because it's a communication language barrier. So I think yeah, it's a good advice to basically talk to both of them and realize how they can connect, you know, what they can do and what they can expect. But it's yeah, work on both sides. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got time for one more question, Cook. Yeah. We need to get out of here. <laughs>
Uh, how about Darika? Okay, so Kun Darika says, if you want to join a global or multinational company, what should you pre prepare for or know before joining? Uh, Anna, Monica, do you want to answer this one? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say from my perspective, uh, you know, you have to be prepared to basically get a little bit of a cultural shock and, you know, be prepared that not everybody will react um, the way you expect them to react. Um, depending on what kind of company it is, because of course, like there is, there are Japanese companies, there are Chinese companies, there are German and American companies, French companies, all of them are different, you know? <laughs> and uh, it's not like Asia is some one concept and Europe is one concept and it's, it's completely the same inside. Yeah. So, you know, um, I would say be, be open, you know, do not be afraid to talk, especially when you're working with uh, Westerners. I think mm -hmm. I can say as a Westerner or the same person from Europe mm -hmm. anyway, uh, that, uh, you know, that people from uh, Western countries, they appreciate openness, you know, they appreciate the initiative. So this is where it's your chance to kind of just talk what you think, who you are, you know, and, um, and be a little bit, yeah, bold about it, um, you know, so you definitely can have a voice and you can voice it and you know, be a little bit vocal about what you think. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's all about like just, I would say, observing how it is mm -hmm. and trying to adapt. And also I think um, like try not jumping to conclusions just by one or two yeah. meetings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the worst thing that you can do to yourself. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know? everything takes Time, right? yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, I see it when sometimes we place a candidate in an organization, mm -hmm. and the first thing they say is, Oh, I, I don't like it here, yeah, mm -hmm. so I don't like the management. But and then they'll want to quit, and you'll say, Well, take a moment, have you talked to the manager? Have you shared your ideas? Have you thought exactly. why it's like this? Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about junior staff here, we're talking about senior staff too. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, if you talk about practical HR strategies yeah. as well. The HR needs to ensure that they're involved in the onboarding and that the line manager is involved in the onboarding, but everything takes time. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we hired a lady who had oh, 17 years plus experience in recruitment. Mm -hmm. And I think the first couple of weeks in this organization, she was like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> because we're, we're, we're very different. Yeah. And you know, if, if she wouldn't have been patient at that time, she could have quit, and yeah. then that wouldn't have worked. And now she's a real integral member of staff. Yeah. So exactly. I think I think time is a great healer. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, June, uh, I think we need to wrap up. So do you want to mm -hmm. tell everybody what is the next topic? Well, um, for the next topic is still in the series of diversity and inclusion. It will be all about women at workplace. So I think it's like, okay, it sounds like very cliche, you know, like we talk about like feminist movement and blah, blah, blah. But, Am I allowed um, to join? <laughs> you are, because we include you. <laughs> okay, so um, I think this topic it will, will be about like, you know, women at workplace and uh, well, for sure we, we have interesting, um, what can I say, like um, topic coming up. Um, regarding to the Barbie movie, I think everybody has seen the Barbie movie like um, everywhere <laughs> in the street right now. So I think uh, we will kind of like reflect our thought on the Barbie movie and how we can um, explain like uh, how it relates to the workplace. So keep up for the next week, uh, next two weeks, I would say. Yeah. So hopefully to see you again next time. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Have Bye. a good day. Bye-bye.